प्रभुभान प्रभु भार ही ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो टू चैप्टर थ्री वर्सेस टू थ्रू सेवन so we'll go right into the word for word brahma the absolute varchasa effulgence kama tu but one who desires in that way yajata do worship brahmana of the vedas patim the master indram the king of heaven indriya kama tu but one who desires strong sense organs prajakama one who desires many offspring prajapatin the praj the prajapatis devim the goddess mayam unto the mistress of the world, material world to but shri kama one who desires beauty teja power kama one who so desires vibhava sum the fire god vasakama who one who wants wealth vasum the vasu demigods rudran the rudra expansions of lord shiva virakama one who wants to be strongly built i'm sorry one who wants to be very strongly built ata therefore viryavan the most powerful ana adhya grains kama one who so desires to but aditim aditi the mother of the demigods swarga heaven kama so desiring aditi sutan the sons of aditi vishvan vishvadeva devan demigods rajya kama those who hanker for kingdoms sadyan the sadya demigods samsadaka what fulfills the wishes visham of the mercantile community ayu kama desirous of long life asvino the two demigods known as the asvini brothers devo the two demigods pustikama one who desires a strongly built body elam the earth yajet must worship pratishtakama one who desires good fame or stability in a post purusha such men rodasi the horizon lokamatro and the earth rupa beauty abhikama 
positively aspiring for Gandharvan, the residents of the Gandharva planet, who are very beautiful and expert in singing. Sri Kama, one who desires a good wife. Apsara Urvasim, the society girls of the heavenly kingdom. Adipatya Kama, one who desires to dominate others. Sarve Sam, everyone. Yajeta, must worship. Paramastinam, Brahma, the head of the universe. Yagyam, the personality of Godhead. Yajet, must worship. Yasakama, one who desires to be famous. Kosakama, one who desires a good bank balance. Prachetasam, the treasurer of heaven, known as Varuna. Vidyakama, to but one who desires education. Girisam, the lord of the Himalayas. Lord Shiva, Dampatya Artha, and for conjugal love. Umam Satim, the chaste wife of Lord Shiva known as Uma. They had made one mistake here. They says, Pacheta Sam, the treasure of the heaven, is known as Varuna. It's not Varuna. It's, uh, it's uh, what's his name? Kuvera. Kuvera, yeah. Okay. So we need a little light here. Need some more light. Throw some light on here. Any light. Just give me a light. Let there be light. Okay. Translation. Very long translation, please listen up. One who desires to be absorbed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti effulgence should worship the master of the Vedas, Lord Brahma, or Brihaspiti, the learned priest. One who desires powerful sex should worship the heavenly king Indra. And one who desires good progeny should worship the great progenitors called the Prajapatis. One who desires good fame. Fortune should worship Durga Devi, the superintendent of the material world. One desired to be very powerful should worship fire. And one who aspires only after money should worship the Vasus. One should worship the Rudra incarnations of Shiva if he wants to be a great hero. One who, one who wants a large, large stock of grains should worship Aditi. One who desires to attain the heavenly planet should worship the sons of Aditi. One who desires a worldly kingdom should worship Vishvadeva. And one who wants to be popular with the general mass of population should worship the Sadhya demigods. One who desires a long span of life should worship the demigods known as the Asvini Kamaras. And a person desiring a strongly built body should also should worship the earth. One who desires stability in his post should worship the horizon and the earth combined. One who desires to be beautiful should worship the beautiful residents of the Gandhara planet. And one who desires a good wife should worship the Apsaras and the Uvasi society girls of the heavenly kingdom. One who desires domination over others should worship Lord Brahma, the head of the universe. One should desire tangible fame. One who desires tangible pain should worship the personality of Godhead. And one who desires a good bank balance should worship the demigod Kuvera. If one desires to be greatly learned, he should worship Lord Shiva. And if one desires to be a good marsh, marital relation, he should worship the chaste goddess Uma, the wife of Lord Shiva. End of translation. Hmm. So these are different uh, personalities who can provide material benefits according to 
the prescribed worship that is uh, what we say uh, offered to them, then Prabhupada's purport will clear everything up. <coughs> there are different modes of worship for different persons desiring success in, per in particular subjects. The conditioned soul living within the purview of the material world cannot be expert in every type of material enjoyable asset. But one can have considerable influence over a particular matter by worshipping a particular demigod as mentioned above. Ravana was made a very powerful man by worshipping Lord Shiva and he used to offer sever head, severed heads to please Lord Shiva. He became so powerful by the grace of Lord Shiva that all the demigods were afraid of him until he at last challenged the personality of Godhead Sri Ramchandra and was ruined himself. In other words, all such persons who aspire after gaining some of the material objects of enjoyment or the gross material persons are on the whole less intelligent as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 720. It is said that those who are bereft of all good sense and whose intelligence is withdrawn by the deluding energy of Maya <coughs> aspired to achieve all sorts of material enjoyment in life by pleasing various demigods or by advancing in material civilization under the heading of scientific progress. The real problem of life in the material world is to solve the question of birth, death, old age, and disease. No one wants to change his birthright. No one wants to meet death. No one wants to be old or invalid, and no one wants diseases. But these problems are solved neither by the grace of any demigod nor by the so-called advancement of material science. In the Bhagavad Gita, as well as in the Srimad Bhagavatam, less intelligent persons have been described as devoid of all good sense. Sukadeva Goswami said that out of the 8,400,000 species of living entity, the human form of life is rare and valuable. And out of those rare human beings, there are who those who are conscious of the material problems are rarer still. And still more rare are persons who, tho those who are conscious of the value of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which contains the message of the Lord and his pure devotees. Death is inevitable for everyone, intelligent or foolish. The Maharaj Pariksit has been addressed by the Goswami as a manasi, or the man of highly developed mind, because at the time of death he left the material enjoyment and completely surrendered unto the lotus feet of the Lord by hearing his messages from the right person, Sukadeva Goswami. But after aspirations for material enjoyment by engaging, I'm sorry, by endeavoring, persons are condemned. Such aspirations are something like the intoxication of degraded human society. Intelligent persons should try to avoid these aspirations and seek instead the permanent life by returning home Back to Godhead. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachari Name Nir Vishesha Sunyavari Pasyat Yere Zatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasri Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Come on, you can do better than that. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare so you might wonder why uh, the Bhagavatam is giving recommendations for worshipping demigods to achieve material benefits. Good question, huh? I received that question uh, by letter one time. What's the purpose of this verse here? Bhagavatam is Amalam Puranam. It's pure. doesn't talk about anything but pure devotional service to the Lord. What is this verse? How does this verse get here? Of course, the next verse also is like that also. And the next one after that is also that. The next two, three, two verses. But 
you will only understand this verse in relationship to verse number 10. And number 10 says, Akama sarva kama uva moksha kama udara di tirena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. But giving all these, uh, what we say, prescribed methods for benedictions, it calls a person less intelligent. Prabhupada makes that in the poem for it, but at the same time, this verse here says, one who has good intelligence, broad intelligence, as Prabhupada used to say, uh, there is medasa, medasa means intelligence, and su means good. So those who have good intelligence, they don't aspire for anything but to go back home, back to Godhead. Or they aspire for pure devotional service. Because any material benefit is temporary. So this verse number 10 says, when you have material desires, you're free from all the material desires, or you're fixed in, uh, in liberation, still worship the personality of Godhead. It also says that in this verse too, here, one who desires tangible fame should worship the personality of Godhead. And one who desires a good bank balance, well, that's another thing. So even even by worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is all famous, one becomes famous automatically. Devotees are famous. Why? Because they're connected to the all-famed pers Personality of Godhead. But the devotees don't aspire for fame, nor do they aspire for any of these things that are offered in this. Why? Because, as Krishna mentioned in the seventh canta chapter of Bhagavad Gita, all these things are limited and temporary, and they're also supplied by me. So even if one has a material desire to achieve some of these things, like a good wife or some good, good strong body or, you know, some good family members for those who are married, still, if one worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna may provide those things just by one's worship. Or he may not. He may or he may not. He may, if he wants to give his devotees something in reciprocation for their devotional service, which they want, or he may not, if he sees by giving this, this person will become less enthusiastic to worship. In other words, their devotional service will be distracted so Krishna won't do that. But maybe it even says he does that one time, and then he sees, oh, well, I gave this person something material, which they wanted, and, and, and now I see they're going away. No more. Then I'll take it away. <laughs> so that's Krishna. He's always thinking of the welfare of his devotee. So here, this verse is very instructive of, of what not to do what not to do. We may have these desires, <coughs> just like the desire for fame is called the last snare of maya. As one makes advancement in devotional service and frees themselves from what we say, the gross forms of sense enjoyment, illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating, and gambling, then they have to go to the root of the cause of these things, which are the subtle desires, profit, adoration, distinction. And these are the subtle desires which devotees struggle with. Devotees generally, not everybody, but generally, generally can give up illicit sex, intoxication, meeting, and gambling. But when it comes to dealing with you know, like pride or the desire for position, fame, or just uh, becoming somewhat proud of one's spiritual advancement, thinking oneself is better than others. <coughs> All these things are the more subtle forms of attachments, <coughs> and these things go deep. But out of the all of the pratishta, 
desire to become famous by performing devotional service because Krishna makes the devotee famous. When the devotee does something to worship the Lord, and the Lord is very play pleased, the Lord will somehow or other make that devotee known to others. It's just the way Krishna is. He wants to reciprocate. But the devotee should think, oh, well, actually, because of the grace of the Lord, I was able to perform this service. Therefore, why should I take any credit for it? The credit goes to my spiritual master. The credit goes to the Lord. The credit goes to the assembly of the Vaishnavas. So the devotee thinks in that way, and that way they don't become, what we say, contaminated. As soon as we take credit for anything we do, there is a certain quality of material at attachment that starts to either increase or develop. So one devotee likes to do nice service for the Lord, and the Lord likes to reciprocate. But the devotee should never think, because of me, it has be it's become, what we say, successful. Krishna has given me the opportunity. Devotional service is both a birthright and a privilege. Why? It's a birthright. Why? Because we have the opportunity to fulfill the actual purpose of life. What is the goal of life? The goal of life is to realize our relationship with God and to act in that relationship and to go back home, back to Godhead. That's the goal of life. Any other goal in life is either not needed or supportive of that goal, depending on what it is. Just like you might need good health to do your own service, so you might work on your health. So you make health a goal. But that goal is secondary because we want good health so we can serve nicely. Health doesn't become the main thing. I'm healthy, therefore, because I'm healthy, everything is okay. It doesn't matter what I do. No. The point is that or what if I need some uh, some energy so I can serve the Lord nicely by distributing cr the spiritual master's books, which he has asked me to do, then I should uh, make sure that I have the required amount of sleep and proper uh, prasadam, everything, so I can do my service nicely and distribute many books and become energetic. So a lot of these things, which are here desirable by the materialists, and even though those who are mixed devotees, um, sometimes we need them for devotional service. But don't worry, Krishna will provide as long as we focus on the essence, how to please Krishna. Krishna automatically takes care of his devotees. Sometimes the devotee thinks, well, you know, I really wanted this and I really need it. Why isn't it coming? Krishna, you know. It's for your service. But actually, what Krishna is doing is that sometimes he makes the devotee wait just to see whether that devotee is actually wants it for his service or wants it for his own personal gain. When Krishna knows that you want it for your, or sees, oh, he wants it for my service, then no problem. But sometimes the devotee... Um, has this mixed thing, something for me, something for Krishna. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is normal in the beginning of devotional service, something for me, something for Krishna. But then we understand that everything that I actually need or want or, or desire in life can be found simply by worshiping Krishna. And two things happen when you have that mentality. One is you get what you want or you lose the desire to get what you want. In other words, visayan vinivartante nihirasya dehinam raso varjam raso pyaspyat param jiswan nivartante. One gets a higher taste. One finds something better, and then by finding something better, what is that? That happiness that we experience in serving the Lord, then that pushes away all these smaller desires which we thought were so important, but now uh, we realize that they're not necessary or so important. So we have to go for that higher taste. And that higher taste comes by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. 
and serving the Lord in a favorable way. So when we get that higher taste, then, and sometimes even if you don't want it anymore, Krishna will give it to you. Oh, here you go. You wanted this. I'm just, and the devotee thinks, oh, all right, Krishna gave me it. I don't really want it, but maybe I can use it for Krishna's service. So that's, that's also there. Krishna is very merciful. So in the seventh canto of the, I'm sorry, seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the first verse 20, 21, 22, and 23, four verses, Krishna talks about the futility of worshiping demigods for material benefits. And in one verse he says, whatever the demigods can provide, they get it from me. Whatever the demigods get, they're getting it from me. So they can't provide anything for you unless it's coming from me. So why worship the demigods? Go directly to the source. Not for material desires, but for the mood of worship like that. So devotees are happy simply by worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Prabhupada makes many examples here. He uses Ravana, how he became power by worshiping Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva uh, he can give, you know, great amounts of power. Shiva is very, very powerful. I think where is it mentioned here? Where does it say? Uh, yeah, there's something about Rudra. Yeah, one who worships the Rudra incarnation of the Lord, he wants to become a great hero. So, you know, Powerful, great hero, practically synonymous. So that was uh, Lord Shiva, uh, that was Ravana, but what happened? He became so, what we say, uh, inflated, ment mentally inflated by his power, that he thought nobody was, nobody could challenge him. He was so proud of that he thought, human beings, they're so insignificant. Because the Rakshasas, the Rakshasas have a planet just above the Earth. It's not too far from the Earth. There's a whole planet of Rakshasas, and there's a whole there's a whole series of invisible planets that are around the Earth that the uh, the scientists can't see with their, you know, instruments. And so on the one of these planets, there's the Rakshasas. So the Rakshasas are much superior both in bodily strength and fighting ability and so many in intelligence than the human beings are. So when Ravana heard, you know, should I take a benediction not to be killed by a human being? He thought, human beings? Pfft. They're just like insects. We just stepped on them. But then that's why the Lord came as Ramchander in the form of a human, <laughs> just to frustrate his... Uh, his uh, power. And then he challenged Ramchandra by stealing his wife. That was the greatest offense he could have probably uh, committed. And then, of course, he not only did he l lose his kingdom, his whole family, everything, but he lost his life also. Mm -hmm. He could have maintained his life after being destroyed in the battle of Kurush, uh, the battle of Lanka, um, all he had to do was give back Sita, and Ram would have let him live. But, and he was given good advice. You know, you give back Sita. You know, she belongs to another man. His in his own brother, Vibhishan, was telling him, you know, you have so much. You know. This is the, this is a very powerful person. He's the Supreme Lord himself. Give back his wife and, you know, you can live. I mean, he saw his whole family being destroyed. His sons were destroyed. His brothers were destroyed. His armies were pulverized by the Lord. Lord Ramachandra killed 14,000 powerful Rakshasas all by himself. Within two hours, he, he eliminated... 14,000. But he saw all this, but he was so puffed up by it. So when one becomes powerful, either material and sometimes even spiritually, 
they had their vision of reality comes becomes a little bit opaque, a little bit clouded with reality, and they start seeing themselves as being special, or what we say better than others, or wanting to control others. That happens in the material world all the time, but even in devotional circuits. You know. So that's why a devotee always has to remain humble and free from false pride. And then that way one can actually chant the holy names of the Lord nicely. So, yeah, this pride, and pride goes before the fall. So we see here how this example of Ravana became so proud that he challenged even God himself. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the demigods, just like Indra, we have the example of Indra. What did he do? When Indra's wife, I mean, when Krishna's wife, Satyabhama, said, I want the Parajata tree that's in the heavenly planet, Krishna is in the mood of satisfying his wife. So he said, oh, Satyabhama, you want that plant? I'll go to the heavenly planets and get it for you. It's not on earth. It was only in the heavenly planets. But it was a prized tree of Indra. So when the Lord came to take the tree, Indra challenged the Lord, and it was a fight between Indra and the Lord. And of course, it, the Lord didn't kill Indra, but he defeated him. And, he's, and then, of course, there was no question. The Lord took the Parijata tree and brought it to the earth planet. So sometimes even we see Lord Shiva when uh, Banasura was being defeated by uh, Krishna. He was praying to Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva came to assist and it was a big fight between Shiva and Krishna. And that's a nice story how Shiva let go of his one... Uh, weapon called the Shiva Dwara, which can create, creates intense heat. And he fired it at Krishna, and Krishna counteracted with the Narayan Dwara, which brings about intense cold. And so it counteracted the, t the intense heat. And Prabhupada said, somehow one can tolerate great amounts of heat, but one cannot tolerate extreme cold. <laughs> now this is an interesting little point in the pastimes there. And finally, Krishna defeated Shiva and then Krishna said after him, why are you fighting with me? <laughs> and, see, and Shiva came to his senses, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so here's an example how having all these opulences, one can become, what we say, a little bit uh, proud of the opulences and act in the wrong way, like that. So, of course, Krishna will give these opulence to his devotees, but the devotees should think, oh, I can use it for Krishna's service. If I have some position, let me use it to do better service. That's the, pos that's the idea of having a position. I can do more service then. I can do better service. So sometimes devotees aspire for a position so they can increase their service to Krishna. Not for their own, what we say, personal satisfaction. Or, you know, uh, let me distribute a lot of books. Not that I want to become the number one book distributor, but I want to get as many books out to the conditioned souls as possible which will please Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. So a devotee may also see that Krishna is giving him or her some great responsibility and facility. So then we think, oh, this is an opportunity to increase our service, to do better service, to, more, to do more service, like that. So the Lord will do that. He'll give just like... We have an example. I know one very rich man. You know, he was quite wealthy, Indian, living in India. He was, you know, traveling around the world just to keep his business going. And uh, 
he became attracted to Srila Prabhupada. And then later on, after Prabhupada left the planet, he decided to take initiation and he took initiation from one of Prabhupada's disciples. And then he was wanting to use all his money in the service of Krishna. So he was, you know, opening up different programs, sponsoring different things. He was giving large amounts of money. But what happened to his business? It increased. It didn't decrease. His business, he told, he told me personally, or I heard him speak personally, my business increased, it increased eight, 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 eight hundred percent. I was struggling to keep my business going, but as soon as I became a devotee and started giving money and started serving like that, Krishna just gave me more and more facilities and my business just expanded more and more and more. Krishna said, oh, yeah, you want to, s oh, you're using your money to serve me. This is nice. Here's some more money. <laughs> so Krishna is always in control. So this was interesting. And you'll see that too. If you give time to Krishna, he'll give you more time. Really. If you give your energy to Krishna, he'll give you more energy. But, you, you know, within a certain range, don't become careless. If you use your intelligence for Krishna, he'll give you more intelligence. If you use your money for Krishna, he'll give you more. In other words, whatever you're using, he's thinking, oh, this devotee is so nice, he's using these things in my service. Here, let, here's some more. Continue. <laughs> this is Krishna. This is Krishna. Krishna is always wants to receive. That's why Krishna consciousness is unlimited. There's no limit how much advancement you make. There's no limit how powerful you can become by using whatever Krishna gives you in Krishna's service. Okay. So... We'll stop here. Any questions or comments? Mm Yeah. Mm. Everything, creation comes down from subtle to gross and winds up from gross to subtle. So in the same way, the f first manifestation of the material creation are the subtle desires, which are, f which are all characteristics of the false ego. That's why false ego is the first manifestation of the anartha for the living entity. And from false ego comes all these other things, these other all these other desires. Yeah. So yeah, just like if you get rid of your gross material desires, you should know that they could also come back if you don't get rid of the subtle desires. Because just like you see, and it's a good example, if you have weeds in the field, and if you cut the weeds, just like we're cutting the grass here with these machines, and it'll all grow back, even the weeds. But if you take and you pull the weed out from the root, it won't grow back. So in the same way, unless we uproot the subtle desires, then they will also again can also produce the gross desires again. Like that. So there, therefore, purification goes from gross to subtle, and creation brings things from subtle to gross. Yeah. And it's the same way with nature. You plant a seed in the ground, and then the roots grow first, and then the plant comes. Same way. So we had 
we had a desire to be separate from Krishna. That's a subtle desire. It's called envy. So, therefore, we come to the material world and then we act out that envy by creating so many things around us so we can somehow or other compete with Krishna or with other living entities to become the enjoyer. Yeah, so yeah, the subtle group one. The subtle ones are the ones that are first. That's why it talks about creation. I think it's in the second, maybe in this canto, how Brahma created. He created five, five principles of ignorance, which are part of the subtle desire of false ego. What is that? The conception that I am this body there's five principles of ignorance. I forgot what they are. Does anybody remember all of those? Any of those five? Fear of death. Yeah, that's one of them. Fear of death. It's like that. The identification of the body. Fear of death. I want to. There's a f there's three more. They're in the. It's in the. Second or third canto. Third canto, right? They call the five principles of ignorance. So, yeah. Any other questions related? Yes. No. Demigod worshippers, for people, Chris Krishna says, Demigod worshippers, is, he calls it Hitragyan, Ritakran. That means those who are less intelligent, they worship the demigods. It's better to worship the demigods than to worship nothing. Because at least you're beginning the process of worship. So those who can't worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, if they stay within the house of Veda, the Vedic, then they can worship the demigods. But then, by worshiping the demigods, they'll understand that whatever the demigods can provide, it's only temporary. So why not? Why worship someone who's only can give me temporary benefits? This is like, you know, there was there's like the man who, who hears that. The uh, policeman is the highest person in the city. So he goes and he, Mr. Policeman, oh, you're the most respectable, you're the most worshipable. So he starts worshiping. The policeman says, no, I'm not. I'm not the highest. It's the chief of police. He's higher. So then he goes to the chief of police and starts worshiping him. Chief of police says, no, I'm not the highest. It's the mayor. He's higher than me. And then the mayor says, no, actually, it's not me. It's the governor. He's higher than me. And then the governor says, actually, no, it's, it's, it's actually the president. He's, he's the supreme. So when we start the process of worship, some people, because they can't understand 
or even accept worship of the Supreme Lord, they recommend demigod worship. But those who know that demigod worship is for the less intelligent, don't do that. Therefore, if you read to your questionnaire, if he reads two more verses, he'll come to verse number 10, which we explain. But one who has actual knowledge, and he, even if he has material desires, or without any material desires, or desires liberation, any of these three desires, still should worship the Supreme Lord, personality of God. So this verse is leading to verse number 10. Verse eight, number 8 and 9 are similar to the, these verses, which again recommends more forms of worship. But then unless you hear from the Acharyas what this verse actually means in relationship to the principle of worship, then you will get, you will think that this, the, the, the Bhagavatam has recommended this as the goal. It's not. It's not. That's why Prabhupada makes that clear in the purport. So Krishna says, those who worship the demigods, Rita Gyan. Rita means stunted, damaged, injured, and Gyan means intelligence. When someone's intelligence is injured, then they worship the demigods. Because even if you achieve what you they give you, you lose it anyway. So why go for something that is temporary and ultimately is going to lose when you can actually get that plus every plus eternal life in the spiritual world? When we understand what is the real source or the real object of worship, is the supreme source who is giving power and support to these demigods also. Demigods are simply limbs of the Lord. They can't do anything independent. So this verse is just leading to higher under thing, understandings. This is mentioned because people, if you don't mention this and then, then defeat it later on, people will think this is okay, even if you don't mention it. That's why it's mentioned. You mention it and you defeat it. That's why it's there. Mm -hmm. Because this is so big. People worship... In the Western countries, people don't worship demigods. They just try for these material things that, we were, that, that the demigods can give. But people in the Vedic culture know that worship is necessary to attain anything because that's the Vedic culture. So therefore, they understand behind the object that I'm seeking, there's a person who can provide that. But in Western society, we don't think like that. We just go, we go for money. We work out in, in the gym to get big muscles. You know, we chase after girls because we think that's the way to do it. <laughs> so the Western countries are pretty much bereft of intelligence uh, even of, of the principle of worship, you know. So they just go for the object of worship instead of going to the Vedas. That's why for those who have some understanding, giving this concessionary statement here allows them to bring to come to the beginning of worship. When they, they're not worshiping anybody. They're only worshiping their false ego. So now here's the chance to learn what worship is. Just like people who eat meat can't give it up. There's concessions in the scriptures. It's called mum sa. Mum means m he. No, mum means me, and sa means he. He, he, and me. So the injunction is. On a dark moon night, you find a goat and you chant this mantra. There's a mantra. And the mantra says, my dear Mr. Goat, 
I have come to kill and eat you, but that is okay because in another life you will come and kill and eat me. You'll kill me and eat me. That's the mantra. So when you know the mantra, do you want to go ahead? You can still go ahead, but because it's concessionary, you can't give it up. In Jewish tradition, what do they call that? Uh, there's a thing for Jewish. Kosher, yeah. Kosher. It's a whole thing. So in every religious tradition, there's concessions for those who can't give it up. But what has happened over the years, the concession has become a standard. And people take the concession as being the principle now. And that's why many of the religions now sanction killing and, and also meat-eating and intoxication. Prabhupada was saying, just like he was saying, there's, there's an institution where the priests have become drunkards. There were 5,000 priests who be had become drunkards. <laughs> because, you know, you're Christian, you have the wine and the uh, host. So you give the host and the wine, those of you who are Catholic. So they drink a little, they drink wine, and they also give a little bit to the, uh, you know, parishioners, the followers. So, but by drinking a little bit of wine, they get in time, they start liking it, and then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a regular affair. But it's part of the worship. It's not meant for, you know, intoxication or even for enjoyment. So, same with demigods. So, we come to the point of understanding that if we worship Krishna, whatever the demigods can supply will automatically come. And if it doesn't come, it doesn't matter because you have something better anyway. You have Krishna. Okay? Is that a yes? Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Should we stop here? What did you have a question? No? Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the word, yeah. Yeah. Well mm. Kama, Kroda, Lopa, Mohan, Madha, and Matsarya, the six enemies. So Madha translates into madness. That's the word. There's Madha, Unmada, and Pramada. There's three three types of Madhas. Madha, Unmada, and Prana. Madha means mad. Uh, Unmada means crazy. And Pramada means completely insane. <laughs> Different degrees of madness. <laughs> Prabhupada said when somebody becomes completely mad, they, they take off all their clothes and they start running in the streets and screaming. I saw, I didn't see it, but I heard one devotee did that. <laughs> he was, he went completely mad, and just running around naked, yelling. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, pride is a form of madness. Because it's completely contrary to our position. What is our position? Trinadapi Sunichena Tayori Vasuhishnuna. That 
the living entity is just a tiny insignificant spark of the uh, you know the entire existence we are just so small even in size we're one ten thousand the tip of a hair if you actually they the shastras give a measurement for the soul it's it's so small it's microscopic you can't even see it you can't even see it with microscopes so to think that one is important or great or you know is a form of madness <laughs> krishna is great is there any kind of pride that is spiritual? There is spiritual pride. I'm proud of my spiritual master. I'm proud of the Supreme Lord who is so merciful. So that pride is directed outward towards those who are merciful towards us. Like that. So that's, that's spiritual pride. But anything material is a form of insanity like that. Because it's completely contrary to the nature, your nature. Lust, you know, lust is a part of our nature. But it's love that's somehow or other been a diverted away from. That's why lust You know, lust means to try to enjoy something material. But the enjoying propensity is there. So when we're not trying to serve the Lord, we're trying to enjoy something separate from the Lord. But pride is completely opposite the living entity's nature. It's not natural to be proud. But to be lusty... Is simply our nature just moved to a different realm, that's all. So lust is more natural to happen than pride. Therefore pride is, that's why it says pride goeth before the fall. If one continues to remain in a proud attitude, thinking oneself important or great, and what happens? And Krishna arranges for something to, to make that person fall down, to wake them up to their... Uh, and what the problem is, is that when you have success in your Krishna consciousness, you start thinking in terms of, you know, I got it together. I'm doing it. I'm okay. I'm making progress. That's all right. But one should never be proud of whatever comes. We're proud of the person who gave it to us. That's all. Just like it says, if Krishna wants... He can make he can make you forget your own name and you can't even remember it. <laughs> he can do that. <laughs> What's your name? Uh Gary. No, no. George. No. Gabriel. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I read there was one story true story where one lady she was very highly qualified and she would teach others how to do things she knew she knew so many things how to do things so people would come to her to learn and she would teach them and if they couldn't learn she would say why can't you do it it's so easy she would say that all the time when people weren't able to learn what she was teaching and finally, what happened is that she got sick and couldn't do anything. 
And then she came to her senses. Krishna arranged for her to get sick, so she could, so, well, somehow she got sick. I don't, know, I don't know exactly how it happened. She got sick. And everything that she was doing before, which was so easy for her, became so difficult and even impossible. And then she woke up to the fact that, oh, yes, I understand why this is happening to me. I was too harsh on other people, criticizing them for not being able to learn. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these are examples. So, pride, we, get, we can, by serving the devotees, we can get over pride. By chanting the holy names of the Lord and practicing uh, chanting from the heart, and we can get over this pride also. We are always in the, the position of dependence. And if we remember that, then everything becomes easy. I'll give, you an, I'll give you a nice example. This is, I saw this happening. We had his preaching center in, uh, in uh, a place called Cincinnati, Ohio. And so we were right on the campus of the University of Cincinnati, practically there, and students would come just walking into our temple, and we would give them prasadam and start preaching to them. And so we were in a good position to really preach. So one professor came, very intelligent man, super intelligent. He was a professor at the university. So he was coming to our classes. And Radha Swami was giving classes. I was also there. So, uh, so Radha Swami, he would ask Radha Swami questions, and Maharaj would give him the answers. But he would take the answers and twist them around and come back with another question. He couldn't get it, you know. His mind was so, what we say, theoretical and so analytical that he'd analyze everything. Everything. So Maharaj was very patient with him, and he kept coming, but he couldn't get the answers because he was over-analytic, probably calls it over-intelligence. So we thought, all right, what can we do to help this man? So we asked him, Maharaj asked him, do you know, how, do you know gardening? The man said, yeah, I'm quite good at gardening. He said, oh, okay. So we need a, a garden made in the backyard for the deities. Can you come during the day and do it? He said, yeah, I'll be here tomorrow with my, you know, my overalls on, ready for work. So he went out. And uh, we gave him all the tools, spent the whole day working in the garden. So we were having programs every night for guests. And he came back that night. He was so happy. He said uh, he was just so happy. He, he was just feeling the, mer the mercy of the Lord. So he's, he was just doing practical service. He was so happy. And then... He said, oh, wow, that was wonderful. Yeah. And now he started to understand things better. So we said, well, he said, we said, is there more gardening to do? He said, yeah, I'm not finished. I'll be back tomorrow. So he came the next day. <laughs> he was out there. He worked all night, day. Come back in at night. He was completely miserable. <laughs> complete, complete opposite. We said, what happened? He said, I don't know. I did everything I did the day before, and I did it exactly the same way I did it the day before, but I don't feel that happiness. So he's, he was analyzing Krishna's mercy. Krishna was merciful because the day, first day he was just working. So the second day he was thinking, well, I did it like this, and I became happy, so let me do it like this again, and I'll become happy again. <laughs> that was his mindset. And Krishna said, 
I don't work like that. <laughs> I don't work like that. So, yeah. And we had to finally explain to him, you know, that's not how devotional service works. You try to serve your best, and if Krishna is pleased, then you'll feel, the, you'll feel his mercy. <laughs> so, he finally, he actually came to Krishna Karchas and started to worship and he never took initiation, but he actually, you know, started making nice advancement for a while. So it was good. So yeah, overly analytic. The p devotional services, you just try to please Krishna. Well, whatever you do, and then that's success. That's all. Do it the best you can, but try to please Krishna. Okay, so we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs>